just keeping it real. I would have been upset. Mary and Joseph didn't even have reservations like I did. And if we're honest, most of us would be frustrated. We travel off to a hotel and they don't have what we asked for, we'd be frustrated. But the Bible shows that Mary and Joseph did just fine. Mary laid the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, in a manger. And as you can see, I got the girls to bring up a manger right over here. This is typically how you and I view the manger scene. Small, modest, humble, cute, made of wood and some hay. And as you know, a, a manger is actually a feeding trough for animals. And Mary laid the king of kings in an animal bowl. That's putting it bluntly. But mangers were, mangers looked a little more like this in Bible time. You know, a mix of, of clay and straw. That would have been a little more like what Mary would have laid the baby Jesus in. There was no room and the Messiah was laid in a manger. And as much as the thought of this irritates me, it got me thinking, what kind of room do you and I make for Jesus in our lives? What kind of room do we make? Do you make room for Jesus? Or do you intentionally or unintentionally push him away? Listen, the truth is Jesus should not have a room in your life because Jesus is the room for your life and today I want to give you four quick thoughts on making room for Jesus in your life making room for Jesus in your life starts by making room for Jesus in your faith is there room for Jesus in your faith well that sounds like a kind of a weird question because Jesus is the reason for our faith but what I mean by that is a lot of people who say they're going to heaven live like hell the route to heaven doesn't go through hell. It goes through Jesus. A lot of people who boldly claim Christ on Sunday are boldly ashamed of Christ come Monday. And it's easy to be a Christian Sunday morning when everybody in this room is a Christian. It's easy to sing praise and worship songs when the guy next to you is singing a praise and worship song. It's easy to be around Christian, other men and women of God. But are you a Christian everywhere else? Monday to Saturday. Are you a Christian? Are you a model of Christ? Do you possess the characteristics that exemplify Jesus? Do people even know you're a Christian? Are you bold in faith? I think all of you, or most of you, have heard the story of how when I was on the way to a church that I used to work at uh, about 10, 15 years ago, how I was cut off by somebody who gave me the finger, the middle finger, not a very polite symbol. And how when I pulled up to him at a traffic light, I discovered that he was in fact a member of my congregation on the way to church. Paul said in Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. If you're a Christian who is ashamed, how are the Bart Simpson in your lives ever going to become Christians? If you don't blatantly live a Christian lifestyle, Students, if you go to the bar and you drink as much as your friends who invite you to the bar and you get even a little bit inebriated, how in the world can you expect them to respect your faith? Gentlemen, if at work you're trying to set a model and you wind up using language. How in the world can you expect these guys to value your standard of purity that you say you have? Ladies, if you're in a group of girls and you're disrespecting your, your, your husband and you're complaining about him, not in terms of a support sense or a counseling sense, but just dissing on this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. How can you, 
you expect your friend to respect the value of marriage that your marriage is built on, where it says that you will respect your husband because your marriage is bound together by the Lord, by the promises that you made in marriage. How are the Bart Simpsons in your life ever going to become Christians if they don't see Christ in you, if you're expressing? Romans said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And you've probably heard this before, but you might be the only Jesus that many people will ever see. You've probably heard that. You might be the only Jesus that someone ever sees. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What kind of Jesus are you? That's what I mean when I talk about making room for Jesus in our faith. It's not enough to believe, as James 2.19 says, you believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe there is a God, and they shudder. And what's worse, some of us believe there's a God, and we don't even shudder. I get nervous. Every Sunday, I'm scared before the service. I'm scared to preach. I am shuddering. And it's not because I don't believe in myself. It's not because I don't believe I'm a good speaker. It's not because I don't like who I am. And it's not because I'm afraid of you. I like you. The reason I get nervous is because I'm preaching the word of God. And I better do right by God. And I should shudder a little bit. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And if I'm going to preach the word of God, I'm going to be a little nervous. And if you're going to share God with your friends, or if you're going to share God on the street, or if you're going to witness, it's okay to be nervous because you should be. And again, not because you should be afraid of them. Not because you should be afraid of what you're doing, but because you're sharing Him. If the demons shudder, we should shudder a little bit. Maybe for a different reason. Just thought you might want to know that. That's some mad respect. Do you want to change the world or do you want the world to change you? Because right now, I would argue, and I'm not speaking for you, but right now, the world is changing the church. Church after church is changing their values, their constitutions, and what they will do, and what is acceptable based on the world, not the word. I could go off on a social commentary right now on what I see, but I will not. I'm going to go back here to the message, but you know, you know what I'm saying, and you understand what I'm saying. Do you want to change the world, or do you want the world to change you? If you want to change the world, talk to Brother Jerry about his class. Tell him you want another class, because you didn't get to participate in this one. Faith, is it supposed to be private or public? Okay, that was not a rhetorical question. Faith, private or public? I think both. I think we can have our own moments with the Lord, but I think my faith better be public. If it isn't public, there's a problem. If your faith isn't public, look at the mission statement of our church. What is it? To go out into all the world to spread the gospel. That's public. I was reading the news this week about a celebrity. This celebrity, she grew up, she was a staunch uh, believer in Jesus Christ. Um, she grew up, she married a, uh, an NHL hockey player. Uh, a girl, his name is Candace Cameron. She played uh, a girl on the TV sitcom Full House. She married uh, Valerie Bure, an NHL hockey player. And she was asked about her faith. And she, she, she doesn't say that I'm a Christian anymore publicly. What she says is that my spirituality, I am very confident in my spirituality. 
Uh, but it's a very private thing uh, between uh, me and my faith. That's the end of the interview. That's as far as she'll go. She won't talk about it. She won't expand it because her spirituality, my spirituality. Oh, there's a lot of people out there right now who claim to be spiritual. Spiritual's the buzzword. You know, it's like the hippies have grown up and now they're using the word spiritual. <laughs>